Hi, Jim. We're going to go ahead and dive in here, but I wanted to see where uh, we got uh, Israel in the uh, 8th century BC, uh, or 7th century BC, 8th century BC. Um, and uh, prophets uh, Amos and uh, Hosea today, but wanted to see if there are any questions or anything. Abby was doing altar yoga, so she may be a little late getting on here. She's usually good for a question or two, but yeah, Bob. Maybe, maybe I, maybe I misjudged the prophets, but uh, my my grandson's middle name is Amos, after the prophet. Uh huh. And so, probably for the very first time ever, four years ago when he was born, I read, started reading the book of Amos. Uh huh. I said, "Wow, this guy's a real downer." <laughs> and I guess most prophets are, are not selling rainbows and unicorns, but but I mean, wow, other than uh, other than, you know, let mercy flow like water, it's kind of a complete downer from start to finish. No, I mean part of part of the prophet is to be the check in the balance on everything else in the culture and especially the monarch, but uh, also the culture. And so yeah, they're not usually happy. There are prophecies of hope, certainly, but there are a lot of doom and gloom prophecies in, uh, in scripture. Uh, a lot of them are aimed at other countries, but some are aimed at uh, the Jewish people, uh, Israel and then uh, Judah as well. So yeah, they're, they're not, uh, they're not going to cheer you up oftentimes. They're, they're the ones saying, you know, they're Debbie Downer saying what's wrong with uh, the situation and what God wants to y'all to fix. Uh, well, even even Isaiah, who's one of the most nice and our most beloved Advent and Christmas readings, then quickly turns immediately after those to start going back to some of those, to the dark and everything's wrong and we need to fix that or else we're going to have a lot of problems. Right. And probably the most hopeful one is second Isaiah, the, the second uh, person from the Isaiah school. And we'll get to him later. Uh, you know, he's the one that starts out with comfort, comfort, my people, says your God, uh, you know, the beginning of Handel's Messiah chapter 40 through 55 is second Isaiah and he's of all the prophets he's probably the most uh the most hopeful of the bunch but yes um somebody did a meme of the prophet Jonah and they used the Bernie Sanders thing from the inauguration sitting there like this uh and that's that's probably really what the prophets are kind of like a lot of the time is this kind of angry old man or angry young man uh railing against issues so and we'll talk more about the prophets here today so good other other questions or thoughts here let me get share screen going here. And that's not too bad. We'll just change the view a little bit here. All right, here we go. All right, so we are today going to be looking at what's happening up in the north, um, mainly focusing on the kingdom of Israel and uh, the big bad boy that's coming down the pipe at them, uh, the big empire of Assyria. Uh, so we're going to spend quite a bit of time with Assyria and with do some talk about prophets too. So Assyria is, Assyria has been there a long time. Assyria was uh, starting uh, in Mesopotamia even before the Jews left uh, Egypt. The Assyrians started in the 1400s BC. And so they, they've been there a while, but they really start to crank up in the 900s, 800s, 700s. And so uh, as an empire, as a threat to other nations, we're hitting it just at the right time or the wrong time, as your case might be, if you're in the northern kingdom of Israel. And so in, in, the, in the 700s, Israel is certainly in the path of uh, where the Assyrians are trying to expand their uh, influence. And also, Remember, Israel's on a land bridge between Egypt and Mesopotamia. And so if the Assyrians want to expand their influence down Egypt, Israel's in the way. Judah's in the way too, but we'll talk about that uh, later. So early in the Old Testament, at the beginning of the Old Testament, Egypt is the big superpower. But Egypt starts to decline uh, in the 900s, 700s, 900s, 800s, 700s. Uh, so we've got this succession of empires that arises in Mesopotamia. Syria first. Then later Babylon will supplant them, then later Persia will supplant them, and then the Hellenistic Greeks, Alexander the Great, Macedonians will come in and supplant them, and then uh, eventually uh, Octavian will defeat Anthony and Cleopatra, and Rome will take over at, at, 
Anthony uh, Octavian will be Caesar Augustus when he's uh, when all the smoke clears. So we've got the succession of empires that'll be coming, and actually the shortest one of all of them is Babylon, but Babylon is the one that con the only one that conquers Jerusalem uh, of these of this bunch. The rest take the land around Jerusalem and take Jerusalem without a fight, basically. Uh, but Babylon actually lays siege to Jerusalem and and twice and uh, wipes it out basically the second time. So Babylon, even though they're short time-wise, uh, is gonna be a little more influential later on, but we'll get to that as we go here. All right, we've already talked about this, but I'll say it again, uh, this was last week, post Solomon, you know, we're starting to get these marks showing up in the secular historical record, not just relying on scripture, but we've also got sources outside of the Bible. Uh, case in point is this wonderful picture of Jehu, that came from the Assyrian palace in Nineveh. Jehu's on the ground, uh, king of Israel, uh, paying tribute to the king of Assyria standing uh, before him, and I guess offering some kind of votive or something to his God. Just a reminder, we talked about this last time, there's a, a rapid shrinkage after Solomon dies, really the last decade of Solomon's reign, and then after Solomon's death, uh, Solomon's kingdom and influence kind of stretch where this red line is, and within about 10 years, it snaps back to the yellow and purple area. So it's a pretty rapid uh, com contraction of Solomon's empire. So at least kind of a vacuum up here that Assyria can fill in. And eventually Assyria will want to fill in more and more and more as they head down towards Egypt. I had this map last time as well. Uh, this is about 100 years after this map. But by this point, Assyria already is filling in down to Damascus. Here's Damascus on this map. So Assyria by this, 100 years after this, will be certainly uh, in charge of this, this region up here, what we would call Syria today. Uh, Assyria today overlaps Iraq, overlaps Syria, overlaps a little bit of Turkey uh, as well. So here's Assyria uh, in the, early, the late 800s, 824. And here's Assyria in the early, 600s, uh, 671. So they really do expand. They take over. At this point, they're already in control of what will be Babylon later on. The Babylonians are already subjugated. Uh, eventually, they'll take over the Egyptians as well. So they're they're the big bad boy on the block. They and they they push. Uh, they don't quite push into all of what is later Persia, but they are pushing against Persia here as well. So they are tough. Interestingly, Judah will be a little bubble. Uh, Judah will be a vassal, but for various reasons, Judah never gets completely taken over. They are a, a subjugated people by the Assyrians, but the Assyrians kind of let them sit as this bubble in the midst of their empire. We'll talk about that in, in coming weeks, but that's kind of a fascinating little, little tidbit there. All right, just to say a little bit, a little discursus about the Assyrians, uh, because they do come up here a lot. Um, the Assyrians were a brutal, nasty, tough, militaristic empire. I said Assyrians and my Siri just came on thinking I was talking to it. Okay, um, brutal. Uh, they they were they used terror. Uh, that, that was their modus operandi was to terrify their enemies and make them surrender. Just you know, when the Assyrians are marching towards you, their goal was to make you surrender instantaneously, because if if you don't surrender, things are going to be so horrible for you. Uh, our reputation is going to be so nasty uh, that we want everybody in the in the Mesopotamian region to quake in fear when we come. What they also had on their side, they had this new high-tech uh, weapon called a battering ram that changed siege warfare completely. Uh, walls were not, later on walls in, you know, the walls of the temple complex in Israel will be these huge blocks of cut stone that are pressed on each other. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about masonry walls with stucco over them or maybe some boulders and small rocks. When I say boulders, I mean rocks like this, not giant boulders, but rocks that are cemented together and stuccoed and masonry. So the Assyrians have had this battering ram and that just made uh, quick work of these kind of walls. Uh, they also later improved their battering ram by building a tower around it. So they could put archers all up in this tower while the battering ram is battering. Uh, and it just, it was, it was a fearsome high-tech weapon. They, they were unstoppable basically because of their military advantages here. Uh, here. Here is an early Assyrian battering ram and 
uh, there's an artist depiction. Here's their depiction, and here's an artist depiction of a uh, similar thing, uh, just making quick work of these, these walls here. Uh, in these Assyrian carvings, the archers are always gigantic compared to the battering rams. The battering rams are probably much bigger. This is probably much better scale here. Uh, later Assyrian uh, tactics had this siege tower built around the battering ram. So here's a battering ram later, uh, siege tower with archers able to be positioned in it. Here's an artist's conception of that. Again, a very fearsome weapon. Uh, if you ever played Civilization V, this is the special weapon of the Assyrian Empire. Civilization Five, you get to build these great siege towers and uh, go tricking off across uh, the world and doing doing damage to your enemies in the early stages of the game. All right, so uh, not only did they have the battering ram, but they also did use this terror. Uh, one Assyrian king made this quote, uh, I have made a pillar facing the city gate. This is a city he's conquered. And I have flayed all the rebel leaders, skinned them. And I've taken, I've clad the pillar in flayed skins. And, and you, you skin the people alive. That's what playing is all about, or at least you're alive to start the process. Uh, and I let the leaders of the conquered city be flayed and clad the city walls with their skins. So the rebels in the countryside are on a pillar facing the city and the rebels, uh, rebellious enemies from the city, uh, their skins are layered on the outside of the wall. And the captives I have killed by the sword and flung them on the dung heap. Uh, so you get thrown in the city dump uh, with the sewage. And the little boys and girls, we didn't throw them in the dung heap. We burned them up. Uh, so this is brutal. Now, this is the Assyrian king saying this. Is he saying this because this is actually what he's doing? Probably, but he's also probably trying to say this in order to instill fear and terror in his future enemies as well. So what the Assyrians wanted, they would always give you the chance to surrender. And they walk up to your city and say, surrender or else. And the or else was going to be really bad. And everybody knew it. Uh, and if so, if you surrendered, usually what they would do is they'd let everybody live. Not always, but usually they'd let everybody live. Sometimes they'd take out the men and uh, let the women and children live, but usually they'd let everybody live. Uh, but then they would take them and resettle them throughout their empire. So just it, it just was a brutal way of uh, shuffling the deck. And so nobody would be uh, in a consolidated position to rise up against them because you know the folks they knew are spread all across the rest of Mesopotamia, no way for any one group to organize. And they bring new settlers, of course, into the new territory from other places in their empire. Uh, the Babylonians didn't do that so much. They shifted the intelligentsia around, not the people of the land. And uh, the Persians actually, the Persian king won great kudos with all the people in Mesopotamia because he let folks go home after these other folks had spread them out. So different tactics, but Assyria, that was their tactic. Just uh, throw everybody, throw them in the mixing pot, and move them, uh, spread them all over the place. Uh, note, uh, 700 years later, this is one of the reasons Samaritans are looked down upon by the Jews. There'd be a few Jewish remnants left in Israel after the Assyrians conquer it, but they brought all these other folks in that intermingled and intermarried with them. And so the Samaritans actually have some Jewish customs but because there are so many foreigners, because there are such mixed blood, uh, good Jews in Jesus' time looked down on the Samaritans as being not real Jews, a mongrelized, uh, watered down Jewish race. Uh, so they're not, they're not true Jews in the way we are. And so that's, that's part of what sets that up. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. All right, so the common tactic was to offer surrender. And if they surrendered, dispersion usually. If not, here is the threat. Uh, once the city was conquered, the Assyrians loved to use flaying and impalement, uh, two very gruesome things. Uh, flaying, again, stripping your skin off. They usually start with the legs, and they had these special knives that would start taking the skin off and then working your way up the body and you know, trying to take the whole skin off of a, a living human being. Of course, they would be dead by the time it was all done, but you know, to start with, you'd be alive. Uh, impalement also, putting you on a sharp spike. And depending on how they did it, uh, you could die in seconds, but they, they usually didn't put you on pikes that way. They were able to set you on pikes if they arranged it just right, that you could last for hours or even days. Uh, in a couple of cases, there are folks that live more than a week uh, impaled on a spike if they miss all the major organs. There are also some evidence they may have used anticoagulants before they uh, stick you on the spike. So stick some anticoagulant 
or some, co I'm sorry, coagulant on this. So, so the blood will clot and you won't bleed out uh, from the spike wound, uh, coagulant. So these, these are nasty people, nasty people. I mean, the Romans had nothing on the Assyrians for, you know, crucifixion was bad and was supposed to be public, and, but uh, impalement was just uh, really brutal. Um, this yeah. is from, go ahead, yes. I was going to say, I thought the Game of Thrones was horrible, but this <laughs> sounds like something right out of that Game playbook. Of, <laughs> Game of Thrones doesn't make stuff up. The Game of Thrones just pulls stuff from human history, so uh, except for the dragons and that kind of thing. But This is horrible. Those, this is not stuff I ever learned in Sunday school. This, this is not what you want to teach the little kiddies. Uh, you know, this is bad. So this is a big uh, freeze. This is from the siege of Lachish. We'll talk about that next week. Uh, number two biggest Jewish Judean city next to Jerusalem. The Assyrians laid siege. And uh, part of right here on this, I'll, I'll zoom in here. Uh, part of right here is showing the Assyrians flaying the captives. And they've got these flaying knives in their hands. And they're starting with their legs and uh, starting to skin them afterwards. So, uh, you know, and this is in the king's palace to... This is a billboard showing you, hey, this is what I did to Lachish. Uh, beware of my power. Uh, here, here are Syrian uh, freezes from other things of, of people being impaled. Uh, just nasty. They, if they caught you right on the rib cage, uh, you could kind of hang there on top of the spike and not die instantaneously. Uh, avoid the heart, avoid the stomach, just kind of go in the side and catch the rib cage was their particular uh, mode that they would often do. Uh, so nasty. Just nasty, nasty people, uh, as far as you know, brutal, brutal to their enemies. So uh, nobody liked the Assyrians, and they would rebel from time to time. Uh, but you know they, they weren't winning hearts and minds by doing this to people. Uh, but they also were brutal enough and powerful enough that they lasted for centuries uh, at this game. So a, a tough, tough enemy. So that's who we're dealing with. That's who's coming down the road uh, towards Israel first in the 700s and then to Judah later in the, the late, late 700s and, and 600s. So this is the big bad boy uh, in, the, in the neighborhood. Father Jim? Yes. Who were the Syrians' uh, forefathers? You know, like Abraham or, well, you know, where, where's their line? Do you know? They, 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 came from, they came from this region up here. I mean, this is where they started and they just kind of expanded out from this area here. Uh, so they're not like the Edomites that had a biblical ancestor like uh, Esau. Uh, they are a separate group from way up. And, uh, Abraham's folks came from Mesopotamia originally. Uh, so there may be some you know, relation here, but the Assyrians started kind of in this northern area of what we would call Iraq today, and maybe even up into Armenia and that kind of region. But, but this was kind of their, their base and they expanded out. And the Babylonians were kind of down here and Assyria expanded into their area. So, uh, like I said, they, they started, I think, around 1400 BC. So they, 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 they weren't this fearsome empire off the, right off the bat, kind of like Rome. Rome starts out as a small group and then they build in power over the centuries. Assyria small, starts out small and gets bigger and bigger and tougher and tougher. Good question. All right, so this is what they want. They want their enemies and their uh, other kings to cringe before them. This is exactly the desired Assyrian uh, response from other kings that they want. All right, so uh, in this period of Israel's history, Israel, the northern kingdom, uh, the king of Israel decided he was going to band together with the king of Aram, what we call Syria, Damascus centered, and some of the other smaller kings around there. And uh, try to withstand uh, Assyria, you know, push back against Assyria, defend each other against Assyria. My Siri keeps going off, that's hilarious. Uh, the king of Judah in Jerusalem refused to do that. He decided I'd rather be a vassal to the Assyrians than uh, press my luck with them. Because of that, these folks declared war on the king of Judah. So this Northern Alliance, including Israel, declared war on Judah. We'll talk about that more next week because we'll talk about Judah, but, uh, the Assyrians uh, came in then, took over Israel, and installed a uh, puppet king, and he later rebelled, and so Assyria came in again really hard and basically wiped Israel off the map completely. They just, uh, they just cleared, the, cleared the deck with Israel. Uh, 722 BC is when that happened. Judah would remain semi-independent for a while. Uh, they were a vassal. They would rebel later. We'll talk about that next week, uh, that freeze of Lachish. 
uh, that long. That was Judah rebelling later, but okay. So 722, Assyria takes Israel out. And since they had this forced resettlement policy, that basically meant that of the Jewish line, 10 of the 12 tribes, or 10 of the 13 tribes, if you uh, are really technically correct, 10 of the 13 tribes are gone. Uh, basically, at this point in history, we lose 10 tribes of Israel. It's the lost tribes of Israel is where this comes from. And only this tiniest remnant of Jews and just peasant Jews, basically, nobody important. Only this tiniest remnant is left. Hush, Siri. Okay. Uh, only this tiniest remnant of uh, any 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 kind of Hebrews is left up in Israel. So really, we do have this lost tribe of Israel thing happening at this point. Assyria spreads them to the winds in their empire, and they never have the gumption to coalesce. Later on, the Jews will be able to coalesce and stay together. Uh, Babylonian captivity, captivity in Europe, uh, you know, all kinds of things, but that's not the playbook with the Northern Kingdom. It's, it's gone, just wiped out from history, uh, lost completely at this point. Uh, unless you're Mormon, uh, they think that they came over to the Americas and became the Native Americans, but uh, all right. And again, when the, when the tribes, when most of the Jews were resettled, most of the Hebrews were resettled, there was that tiny remnant that stayed behind and they did intermingle with folks that came in. That's where the Samaritans came from. So basically that leaves in what we call the Levant, the Holy Land, that leaves the kingdom of Judah. And that's why we get the words Judaism. That's where we get Jewish, that's where we get Jew from because uh, Judah is the main tribe that's left behind. Uh, Judah also has uh, the tribe of Benjamin, which is a tiny tribe that's glommed onto them and sticks with them. And uh, there are a few Simeonites in, that are able to stay in Ju Judaic territory. Uh, so we, we kind of get, uh, and then the Levites, the Levites are extraterritorial. So there were Levites in, Assyria, in Israel that were wiped out by Assyria. There are Levites in Judah that can carry on. So basically we get two and a half, two and three quarter tribes uh, left. Uh, Judah and Benjamin, plus you know, some Levites and some few Simeonites. But basically, that's it. Uh, so all the others, Ephraim and Manasseh and Reuben and Asher and Dan, you know, gone. Gone to history at this point. All right. Any, any thoughts or questions so far before we get into prophets here during all this time? All right, so it's during this time that we get the first of the writing prophets, the, what's called the latter prophets in the Jewish Old Testament, the Jewish Tanakh. Uh, and the latter prophets arise, uh, and we get Amos and Hosea arising in Israel. We get Micah and Isaiah arising in Judah, almost simultaneously. Kind of these four of them almost kind of pop up at the same time. Now, why are they the latter prophets? What's that latter part mean? Well, it means that uh, they are later than Elijah and Samuel and Elisha, uh, those prophetic figures from earlier in the book of Kings. And unlike those previous prophets, all these latter prophets leave behind writings or their schools preserve writings. Uh, we, we get collections, anthologies of their prophecies, uh, and we've got them in our Bible today. We've got them in the Jewish Bible, they're in the Christian Bible, certainly. Uh, so the latter prophets are the, the writing prophets as opposed to the prophets that we just read about their deeds like Elijah, Elisha, Samuel. Uh, the latter prophets are also divided into a couple of categories, uh, major and minor, and that's completely based on length. Not, it's not a, a judgment of importance. It's based on word count, uh, word count only. And so in the Jewish Bible, uh, they talk about, they, 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 talk about the books of the former prophets. They include Joshua in that, interestingly, the book of Judges, the two books of Samuel in the Christian Bible, one in the Jewish Bible, the books of Kings, one book in the Jewish Bible. So they consider these the early prophets, the former prophets. And the latter prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the 12, the minor ones, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And they put all these guys on one scroll. So there's a scroll of Isaiah, there's a scroll of Jeremiah, there's a scroll of Ezekiel. And in the Jewish Bible, there is a book of the 12. In Christian Bibles, these are 12 separate books. But in Jewish Bibles, this is one big giant globbed together scroll, one big book of the 12 minor prophets, 12 sections for these 12 minor prophets. 
But all of these, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12 minor prophets are all considered the latter prophets because we have their, uh, their later historically and we have their writings uh, preserved in some form. Now, trivia question, Christians stick another prophet or another person in here with this prophet section. Uh, and strictly speaking, the Jews are probably more accurate than we are because uh, this person really is not a prophet. He is set he is set in this time period, uh, but it was written much later. So anybody know what's missing here? After Ezekiel? Book of Daniel. We'll talk about Daniel later. Daniel, uh, in some, some fundamentalist charts, uh, conservative charts, they'll put Daniel uh, in with the prophets. But really, Daniel is written in the time of the, the Hellenistic Greeks. Uh, against them, and they use the time of the, the Babylonians and the Persians as their setting to talk about the Hellenistic Greeks. Uh, it's kind of like the movie and the TV show MASH. MASH said a lot about Vietnam, but they, they did it in Korea. They, they said it in Korea, but it was talking really about current issues in the 70s a lot of the time. Or for another example, the other direction, Star Trek. Star Trek in the 60s was dealing with 60s issues, but they said it in the 23rd century. Uh, to kind of hide it, disguise it. So Daniel will be that kind of book. It'll be written later and set back in this time period, but it doesn't come from this time period. And it's not a collection of writings by a Daniel uh, in the same way that Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Amos, Hosea are. So Daniel, Daniel is a separate kind of book. Daniel is actually closer to Revelation uh, than to any of the other prophets as far as style and tone and genre. But in Christian Bibles, we, we tuck him in here. In Jewish Bibles, they don't. They stick him with the writings later on, interestingly. He's in the third section of Jewish Bibles, uh, which is probably more accurate. Uh, but it is what it is. Uh, we're, we're not going to be able to change Bible arrangement at this point. It takes too many you know, it's, We've been doing it that way for too long. So, All right, so latter prophets. Let's just do a little quick discursus about what prophets are. We had this in the book last week. I said let, I wanted to delay it a week to talk about it this week. So the Greek, the Greek word is prophetes. Uh, and literally that word means spoke person, spokesperson or the person that speaks before. Uh, speaks before means in front of you. Uh, he comes before you and speaks a message from somebody else, basically, is the, uh, the implication of that word. So one who comes in front of one party to speak on behalf of another party. Uh, so prophetes, and that's certainly where the, the prophet aspect comes from. But the earlier Hebrew word is nabi or navi, uh, like Spanish, the BV sound kind of uh, overlaps. And so in Hebrew, the prophet is the navi, or the navi, the one who is called. Uh, and the implication is called by a deity, called by God. Uh, so it's, it's more of a spiritual term in that way. Messenger is more the prophet thing. Uh, the call and the spiritual inspiration is more the emphasis with the Hebrew word. And Hebrew scripture often use the term man of God uh, as a synonym for Nabi or an alternate title. Uh, it's, it's different words. It's not Nabi of God. It's just man of God. But the, the, the Nabi, the one who's called by God or the man of God is the way you find these prophets referred to in the Old Testament. So far so good. All right, so biblical prophecy, there, there's a wide variety of practices. Your book, uh, the book goes into some of this. Um, some, and, and this, this is also cross-cultural. This is not just Jewish prophets. This is uh, prophets from Aram and Assyria, and Babylonia, you know, some Egypt. You know. there, there are prophetic type figures in all of these cultures. Uh, they're not doing explicitly the narrow version of prophet that uh, the Jewish prophets do, but the, the, these things are cross-cultural in the area. But uh, some prophets in scripture practice divination, uh, somehow consulting something in order to determine a divine answer. Um, you might think of the Oracle of Delphi being a, a kind of parallel to that. You go to the Oracle of Delphi in Greece to get the answer to your question. And there are times when the prophets and the priests, for that matter, are asked to do some divination, to speak, uh, to, to do something to check out what God wants. Uh, 
The high priest has an umen and a thuman in his ephod, his breastplate, that is able to determine. We don't know what it is, but it gives a yes or no answer. Uh, it's a magic eight ball, basically, that tells what God wants. Uh, yes or no. It doesn't have a bunch of answers, just one, or, one of two answers, yes or no. But there is some divination that goes on in the prophetic job description. Also, there are some descriptions that are kind of wild that uh, the, uh, the prophets at times seem to be kind of like uh, charismatic Pentecostals. They, they get, get caught up in the spirit and there's ecstatic frenzy at times with these prophetic figures. Uh, Book of Samuel here is an example. Samuel uh, says to Saul, as you come into town, you're gonna meet a band of prophets. Uh, they're gonna be playing their instruments. Uh, music is also part of doing prophecy in early days, uh, interestingly. Uh, and then Samuel says to Saul, the spirit of the Lord is gonna possess you and possess, I mean, that's a strong word. And you will be in a prophetic frenzy along with those prophets and be turned into a different person. That God's spirit is gonna kind of seize you and you'll go into a temporary prophetic state. And they ask, oh, is Saul among the prophets at this point? Well, he's temporarily uh, caught up in the spirit of God, just like the prophets are. Uh, what this frenzy is, uh, are they dancing? Are they whirling? Are they you know, uh, doing other things? We don't know, but there's some kind of ecstatic uh, spiritual experience here, uh, at least with, with this, these prophets uh, in, in the book of Samuel. Also, uh, in this wide variety of practices, there, there is the aspect of being a seer or a seer, uh, so where, where the English word seer comes from. Uh, those who can see what's happening now uh, and have supernatural insight, message from God, somehow they, they are in communication with God and they can, they can know what is happening and what's coming. Uh, so there's this seer aspect of prophecy. And a lot of what we think of as the biblical prophets is this seer function, the one who is telling uh, what God's doing right now and what God's going to be doing uh, in, the, in the future. But, with biblical prophets, this is important. The, the great quote is they're more about foretelling than foretelling. They do some foretelling about what's coming in the future, but the bulk of what they're doing is talking about what's happening now. Uh, this is what's happening now. Thus says the Lord, you are screwing up. Uh, get your act together, get straight, get back to what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, the days may come, and there's some foretelling. The days will come when such and such happens, but uh, what's happening now is oftentimes the bulk of what they're doing and telling the future is less of what they're doing. Jimmy, did you want to get in? Yeah, I mean, isn't it kind of like on some of that with like post-apocalyptic genres or something saying that like, if we keep going down the societal road, this may be where we're going to end up, not more than this is exactly the future that's going to happen. Right, right. Let's hold that thought. That's a, a good insight. And we're going to hold that thought for a second. Okay. One thing, though, about these prophets, the focus really is on the present and the near-term future. They're not, talk, they're not trying to talk about centuries in the future. You know, there aren't prophecies about America. This is not Nostradamus doing these weird little oracles that may or may not apply five centuries from now. Uh, they're trying to get the, get the country together because if you don't get your act together, this is what's going to be happening soon. Uh, you know, Jose and Amos are worried about Syria coming. If you don't get your act together, Syria is going to come and, you know, uh, all right. Uh, and you know, the, the, you know, we as as people of faith, we believe that they are inspired by the Holy Spirit. That God is somehow involved in these prophecies, and you know, thus says the Lord is often what their common introduction is. That they've got these messages somehow through prayer or some other divine uh, means, and thus says the Lord. Uh, now, here's the question for people of faith. This is not a historical question. This is a theological question. Couldn't God give prophets information about events that will be happening in the, in the distant future? And the answer is, well, of course. God could do whatever God wants to do. But the larger question is, would God want to do that? I had a liturgics professor that uh, you'd ask him a question, and oftentimes the answer would be, well, you, you're, you could do that, but I don't see why anybody would want to. Uh, and uh, that's kind of the prophets. Why, why would you give distant information? Um, you know, would it do any good for Isaiah to talk about Columbus uh, sailing across the Atlantic Ocean? Well, they're worried about the Mediterranean Sea. They don't know what the Atlantic Ocean is. Uh, Italy, Spain, you know, what the hell? Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's so, so that's not helpful. Um, 
you know, the prophets, God could say, all right, uh, say unto the people, E equals MC squared and force equals mass times acceleration. You know, you could do that, but there'd be no reason that that would be such a bizarre thing. Um, you know, same with the Genesis stories. Uh, you know, I think, I think Genesis is inspired by God and God wants the people to try to understand it in terms they understand. Uh, but does, uh, you know, 13.7 billion years ago, there was a singularity and there was a rapid uh, inflation and expansion of all matter in the entire, you know, the, the, there's no frame of reference. Uh, light, dark, waters above, waters below, that's understandable. So, so we need to be careful with the prophets. They're, they're not talking about later things. That's not their primary intention. And we'll, we'll talk about that more with Isaiah. Uh, when Isaiah talks about things that we read at Christmas time and during Advent, uh, yes, there are, we'll, we'll talk about this in a second. Hold that thought, Jim. Um, the other thing, uh, which is fascinating with prophets, is a prophecy have to come true and be fulfilled in order to be a true prophecy. Uh, and I think the best analogy here is Charles Dickens, Ebenezer Scrooge. When the ghost of Christmas present is showing him things, Scrooge asked the perfect question, and this really applies to the prophets. Are these things that will be, or only things that may be? Uh, men may change, men's courses will foreshadow certain ends, and if they're persevered in, if they keep going down this path, they'll lead in a certain direction. But if the courses be departed from, then the end will change. Tell me that's the truth, spirit. That's what Scrooge wants, and sure enough, that is what happens. He is able to make a change, and the future changes. He's not going to die a lonely uh, barren man, but he, he, you know, he uh, helps spread love and joy and Christmas and all that. So with prophets, uh, do prophecies have to happen or are these the trajectory you're on? If you don't make a change, this is where you're going. But if you make a change, uh, you can go a different direction. And that's very much the way they function. Uh, I love this. This is kind of an, uh, uh, an easy example for us. It's asking a priest for a decision and not a prophet. But um, there's back in 1 Samuel, uh, it, it was told Saul that David had holed up in the city of Keilah. Saul said, great, I can trap him in Keilah. He shut himself into a town with gates and bars. So he got his army together to go to Keilah uh, to besiege David and capture him and his guys. And so David hears that Saul is coming and plotting this. And he says to Abiathar, bring the ephod. Uh, I need to inquire of God. And David says, God, I hear that Saul's coming to Keilah. He's going to destroy the city on my account. Will Saul come down as I have heard? Uh, God tell me, and God says, yes, Saul will come. Then David says, will the guys of this town surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And God says, yes, they will surrender you. So David and his guys leave town. And they wander and aren't in town anymore. And when Saul hears that David had escaped from Keilah, he doesn't go there. All right, so is this a false prophecy on God's part? Did God give the wrong answer to David that uh, Saul is coming? Well, Saul was coming. Uh, and if, if Saul did come, would the city surrender him? Yes, but David left town, so that never happens, and Saul never comes. So think about the prophets that way, and the Ebenezer Scrooge thing. Will happen or may happen only if we stay on this path. And that's, that's very much how the prophets function. Course, good. All right, Jim. Yeah, yeah, job. So, were there writers who uh, prophesied, and I wouldn't say prophesized, who said uh, it's logical to assume that if you continue this way, these things will happen without without invoking God? There, at this point, there probably aren't a lot that claim to be, uh, you know, secular prophets. There, are, there are probably people that could figure things out. And the prophets, you know, you can kind of figure out prayerfully. But you know, how how does God give these messages to people? Part of it is for your mind and your intellect and things. Uh, and, and so I, I don't know if I, I know if there are all kinds of examples of false prophets that give the king the message he wants, and then one of the biblical prophets comes in and says, "Uh, -uh, uh that's not what's going to happen." I don't know of any kind of secular prophets from that era that kind of say things uh, just based on on the trajectory of the society. Uh, there, there may be a job, but I'm not aware of anybody in that in that genre. That's that's a great question. All right. Now, 
one of the things about prophecy is history often repeats itself and human beings are very much the same. Human nature doesn't change that much. And so prophecies that are applicable in the prophet's time may also have meaning for us. This also counts for Revelation. Revelation is about the 90s uh, AD and the situation then for the most part. It's not about the 21st century. Uh, but human nature being what it is, empires being what they are, uh, human sin being what it is, Revelation has a lot of uh, message for us. Same thing with the prophets. The prophets are addressing problems in their culture but we still have some of those same problems, uh, many of those same problems. And so their message uh, also applies to our time as well. Now, the, the, the danger uh, is to say, well, the prophets are writing to us and not really writing to anybody in their time. No, uh, they, wouldn't have, they wouldn't have been likely to preserve the writings if they didn't have a, an applicability at the time. But they also can speak to other generations very much so. Uh, and so the, the, the technical term is multivalent. You may remember chemistry, valence electrons, different layers of electrons. Uh, prophecies can have layers. There's the original meaning, uh, the core meaning, but then there can be all kinds of other layers uh, stacked up like an onion uh, around it. Ogres have layers, Trick said, like an onion. Uh, prophecies can have layers. There can be applicability uh, much, much later as well. Uh, and so we, we, we'll, we'll talk about that next week, especially with Mike and Isaiah, because we read Mike and Isaiah and apply them to Jesus. And I think that's a very good thing for Christians to do. But that does not mean that the Jews at the time were waiting around saying, oh, well, in 700 years, uh, we'll figure it out when, uh, when the Messiah comes. No, they, hadn't, they, they understood the prophecies to mean something then. Uh, and we also can understand it means something with Jesus later on. And the one does not preclude the other. All right. So, and Jimmy was saying some of that. So the main focus again is the present. They're, they're really trying to interpret current events and near-term near -term future foretelling. All right. So with Amos and Hosea, they are talking about a Siri coming on the pipe. And like John said, you know, probably anybody in their culture could maybe that had half a brain could probably figure that out. Uh, okay. They've taken Damascus. Uh, who's next? Uh, well, it could be us. Uh, so that's, that's a logical prediction. But what Amos and Hosea also do, and here is part of their special prophetic role, is they also talk about what this means theologically. Why is God allowing Assyria to do this? Uh, is there some reason that Assyria is coming? Maybe it's because of our sin. Maybe we're not doing what God is supposed to be doing. Maybe God is wanting to use Assyria as an opportunity to get you to get straight with him uh, and turn uh, and make a change, make and to repent and all those things. So the deeper theological meaning, what is behind, what, what's behind the events that are happening now and what's behind the events that are coming soon and what's God's role in all this. So that's very much a, also a part of the prophetic uh, role and, and task. Okay, from the book, they, they, they give a nice little summary about all the possible things that prophets do in scripture. Uh, and, and in the books of the prophets, you get this stuff. You often get some biographical materials about the prophets, not always, but often they have them. Uh, sometimes they're in the third person, sometimes they're autobiographical in the first person. So sometimes it's, it's been clearly collected by somebody else and you know, a disciple later on, a scribe. Uh, we know about Jeremiah's scribe, his name is Baruch and he's mentioned in the book of Jeremiah. So it's very clear. Isaiah, we don't know who collected his stuff, but he apparently has a pretty big school that they talk about, the, the school of prophets is with him. Uh, so, you know, there's some autobiographical stuff in Isaiah and there's some stuff written about him in the third person, interestingly. Also, these prophetic books have oracles or speeches or you know, prophets, we call those prophecies from the prophets, often poetic. Uh, and they, they include all kinds of technical things, uh, covenant lawsuits, uh, judgments, oracles against the nation, judgment oracles, messenger speeches, like a king would send a, an envoy, uh, songs, hymns, calls, uh, laments, law, proverbs, symbolic gesture. Uh, Ezekiel is told to lay down and bake bread on human dung as a symbolic gesture. And he says, I, I want to keep kosher, God. Don't make me do that. And God says, okay, use animal dung. Uh, okay, uh, great. Uh, and build a, build a little city uh, and uh, you know, put little siege ramps against this. this is, take a brick and make it a city and you know, siege, build a little tiny siege ramp. This is what's going to happen to you. Uh, symbolic gestures. Uh, prayers, wisdom sayings, and visions. So you, in the prophetic books, you'll get all these things. You won't always get all these things in one prophetic book, but in the latter prophets across all the writings, these things keep cropping up. 
uh, as repetitive things. So it's a, it's a good list there, all the variety of content in the prophets. Okay, real quick, Amos and Hosea. Your book actually deals with Amos and Hosea pretty thoroughly. I won't go into much with them, but let's put them on the timeline here. Come on, timeline. Come on. Uh, there, there it goes. Nope. There it goes. There it was. Okay. So this is a timeline of the United Monarchy, and then it splits into Israel and Judah, and then it carries over to the next page. Uh, Israel gets wiped out, and Judah keeps going for a while longer until their exile, and they come back. And this tries to put the various prophets uh, historically in place there. Uh, it includes the prophet Daniel, who, as I said, was not a prophet. That's a later thing, but it's okay. We'll give the, give the graph a break because it's helpful in other ways. But down in this section here is where we have uh, the, the kind of the, the end of Israel and 722 Assyria wiping them out and Amos and Hosea prophesying in the north. And next week we'll talk about Micah and Isaiah prophesying in the south in the kingdom of Judah. So, uh, so here they are. So they're, they're contemporaries roughly. The, these, these, four, these four are kind of the first four great latter prophets. Uh, three of them are minor as far as length of prophecies. Isaiah, of course, is the big dog as far as uh, volume of stuff. Uh, but they're all roughly contemporaries here. Uh, Mike and Isaiah, in fact, have some prophecies that are almost identical. Did Micah copy from Isaiah? Did Isaiah copy from Micah? Did God uh, give the same message to both of them? But beaten swords into plowshares, all that stuff, we'll talk about that next week, but that's in almost verbatim in both Isaiah and Micah. Uh, but today, Hosea and Amos, real quick here, up in the, up in the northern part of the kingdom. So um, don't want to go into great depth, as I said. The textbook does a really thorough job on them if you want more. There's plenty of stuff written about both of them. But Amos, uh, about the middle of the 700s, Amos is a prophet in Israel, but he's from Judah. So he's from the southern kingdom that's instructed by God. He's instructed by God to go to the northern kingdom. Uh, he's a tender of flocks and sycamore trees, which is where you get cheap figs, not uh, fig trees, but sycamore trees give you cruddy figs. Uh, but later scholars have looked and said, really, the language, uh, it used to be thought he was kind of just a poor farming guy, uh, you know, but uh, a lot of scholars are pushing back on that, saying he really is probably a pretty wealthy landowner uh, that leaves behind his stuff. Uh, he talks about the poor and stuff, and so they used to say, well, he's identifying with the poor because he is poor, but there's a lot of pushback now and saying, no, uh, that's probably, uh, you know, he's giving that message for other reasons because God's giving it to him, and, uh, you know, he probably is a, a higher socioeconomic level than that. But he is called by God uh, and sent north to Israel. And he's, he's very clear that he's not a professional prophet. He's not from a prophetic school. He didn't grow up being trained as a prophet. He's a, he's a farmer, uh, landowner, uh, you know, tending, tending flock. He's got sheep and fig trees. Uh, but God called him, and so he goes. And he goes north uh, and gives these prophecies. Uh, and he begins with prophecies about uh, all the pagan nations. They're judgments on all the nations around there, Aram, Philistia, Philistia Edom, Moab, and those happen in a lot of prophetic books. Uh, but what the prophets also do, and this is important, is they don't just, you know, you, you can say, oh yeah, give it to them, give it to them, prophet. Uh, yeah, we don't like those foreigners either. Uh, you just lay it on them. But then they also say, okay, and here in our country, this is what we need to do differently, because you all are screwing up too. Uh, yeah, well, that doesn't make them as popular. Uh, prophesying against the enemy countries, that, that makes you popular. Prophesying against your own country and your own people and your own king, uh, that gets you in trouble. Uh, Jeremiah got arrested for it. Everybody hated Jeremiah. We'll get to him in a few weeks. Um, but there's a strong message of judgment in uh, Hosea about Israel. And, and what's interesting here, uh, last week we talked about emerging monotheism in Judas, Judaism, that God's God of all the world. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Uh, we still have other gods at this point, uh, lesser gods. Uh, they're not the God of Israel. But what's starting to happen with the prophets, and this happens in Hosea, is that God is not just concerned with his turf. He's concerned with other turf. Uh, he's not just worried about his own nation. He's worried about other nations too. Uh, in a world where my God's jurisdiction stops at the river and your God's jurisdiction starts there and goes to the mountains and then somebody else picks up on the other side of the mountains. Uh, this is a pretty radical thought that no, uh, our God is in charge of all these countries, all these nations and has a message for all of them. Uh, 
later on, as we said last week, the Jews will become monotheists and say, our God's the only God. The other gods are not even gods at all. They're false idols. Uh, but we do have some of that. Uh, so just real quick, we, we had this last time. So we're still in the stage of monolatry, uh, which means one worship, mono worship. I, I worship one God, uh, but there are other gods out there. Uh, first commandment, don't, don't have any other gods in my face. Doesn't mean there aren't other gods, but don't have them. Uh, don't worship them. Don't have them in my face. But monotheism, the later statement, the later place where Judaism gets to, and really Judaism invents this. Uh, they're the first culture to do this. Uh, our God's the only God. There is no other. He's the God of everything. Uh, if you think there are other gods, you're wrong. Uh, one God. Uh, the Jews invent this, but they're not there. They're not quite there yet. All right. So uh, Amos also has, there's a number of these visions, interesting visions where Amos sees something and has to interpret it. He sees a mystical vision of a basket of fruit, a summer fruit, and a, or a mystical vision of a plumb line beside a wall and the wall is crooked. Uh, and he has these, these kind of visions and interprets them. Uh, we actually read those uh, in year C during the summer. Uh, also, most concerning for Israel, what Amos is really railing against is the way that the poor are being mistreated by the rich. And that's, that's a huge thing that applies, like we said, multivalent uh, in many cultures. That's still applicable. Um, and, and probably the most famous line from Amos, uh, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Uh, that was something that was picked up by Martin Luther King as an important statement in the civil rights movement. Uh, the civil rights monument to those uh, you know, who were killed in the civil rights struggle uh, has that quote from Amos on it. This is in, uh, it's in Montgomery or Birmingham. It's in Alabama. Where is it, Jimmy? Do you remember? We went to see it. It's in central Alabama. Uh, I think Montgomery. I think it's Montgomery. But it may be, maybe Birmingham. I'd have to look that up. It's been a while since I've been there. But uh, on this monument is this flowing water uh, and you've got all these little events that happens. Here's the Edmund Pettus Bridge here uh, and all that. Uh, over here, um, Episcopal Saint, uh, where is he? Um, crud. I thought I, I looked at this. Oh, yeah, here it is, Jonathan Daniels, seminary student killed by a deputy in Haynesville, Alabama. Uh, one of my dad's classmates. Uh, went down and was uh, blown away, jumping in front of a little black girl. Uh, the black girl is now a priest uh, also. She's in her 60s now. Uh, but uh, Jonathan Daniels uh, is our calendar of saints, but he's on here too. Uh, and Martin Luther King is kind of the last one. His assassination is kind of the end of this. But anyway, uh, Amos was important to the American Civil Rights Movement. Real quick, uh, Hosea. Hosea has, has a kind of a wild uh, thing. We talked about prophets sometimes being told to do things and enact things. Uh, Amos is told to marry, the old translation is a prostitute or a woman of whoredom, with a W, whoredom. Uh, and there's all kinds of scholarly discussion. Is she really a prostitute or is she just loose and promiscuous, uh, which in that culture was not uh, looked upon with favor. Either way, she's not looked upon with favor. Uh, but God tells Hosea to marry her, and uh, even though she's not faithful, as an object lesson to all the people of Israel, as a way that God is loyal to his people, even though they're not faithful. They worship other gods. They're promiscuous, uh, but God is faithful to them. And Hosea uh, deals a lot with that. Uh, and there's all this wonderful stuff in Hosea. Uh, name the children this. Are they their children or are they her children? Uh, by other men. We, that's not always clear. Uh, but some of the names are very symbolic. Uh, you know, name this child, not my people. Because y'all are not my people when you go after foreign gods. I'd just like to name a kid that. Uh, what's your name? Not my people. Great. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate having that name. Uh, but there is also hope later. Uh, later you can change the name to you are my people. Uh, so there, there's some hope there. Uh, and Jose is very clear, Assyria is coming, as was Amos as well. And Jose is even more clear, Assyria is coming and God's letting it happen because you all are screwing up. And so God's not going to protect you. God is not going to stop the Assyrians. He could if he wanted to, but he's going to let uh, the Assyrians take their course because of the way you're messing up. All right, so that's all I'm going to say about Hosea and Amos. Next week, we'll get Isaiah and uh, Micah and talk about the southern kingdom. But the northern kingdom at this point, wiped out by the Assyrians, the 10 lost tribes of Israel are gone. And for the rest of the history of Judaism, 
uh, the focus is going to focus south in Jerusalem. Uh, later, some of these folks will head north again and resettle in the area of Galilee where Jesus grew up, uh, but they're coming from, from this part and settling up north in, in the good land, but they didn't come from there. Uh, they, they, Judaism will, the focus will switch to the south there. Okay, went a little long today, but any, any questions or thoughts here? I'll stop the screen here. Anybody? So we had a couple of downers. We got the downers of the Assyrian Empire. We got the downers of the, the prophets. But uh, Kathleen, you were wanting to say something. Yes, I, I am so very, very grateful for Jesus, for his life and his suffering and death and resurrection and that I have a relationship with God because I might have been one, one of those wiped off the map several decades ago if we were still under the Old Testament. Yes. yes. <laughs> so I'm very grateful this morning. <laughs> good. That's good. Other thoughts here? All right, well, we'll call it a day with that. And uh, next week we'll pick up with uh, the same time period in the Southern Kingdom and what's going on there and uh, with uh, Micah and, and Isaiah as our focus. And a little bit more about Isaiah because he is a big guy as far as writing. So, all right, y'all, we'll take care and we'll see you see next time. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank